my name is Linda Morley and I am an English professor in the Department of English Language and Literature. And my main areas of uh, teaching and research are in can, um, Canadian literature, in particular post-World War II and contemporary Canadian literature. And I think of Canadian literature very broadly to also include writings by First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. And I've done quite a lot of my research on um, those um, constituencies within Canadian literature. So I tend to work on, in terms of my teaching, I, I teach a broad range, but I'm also always trying to look at um, works by authors who are lesser known um, in terms of public and knowledge, popularity, and also some, sometimes the, um, the scholarly community as well. Life writing really is a, a very loose and kind of baggy, capacious hold all term. Um, autobiography, and some people write auto with the slash in biography because that's been the more traditional forms. Either autobiography, so the life, the whole life story written or told by the person him or herself, um, or biography, which is the life story told of others. But there are all kinds of other um, kinds of life writing, including letters that are exchanged amongst participants personal diaries. Um, uh, there's been a, quite a lot of work done on, on diaries, for instance, both in print and then also when people started using the personal computer to write their diaries. And now things like, um, you know, blog, personal blogs and Facebook and, and, um, and even email and Twitter, all of those are kinds of um, life writing texts, if you like, that can be studied. Um, but at the heart, there's always the sense of constructing this person, this, and it's a personal narrative that has some truth value. I've done quite a lot of work um, on First Nations uh, memoirs, in particular about residential school experience, and I think that um, clearly I don't have any personal connection to those histories, but I really do think that it's important for all Canadians to familiarize themselves. Uh, with um, issues that concern not just um, Indigenous people in Canada, but all of us. And I think it's a part of our kind of civic responsibility to inform ourselves. Uh, the media doesn't do a very good job. The media tends to always sensationalize um, issues that concern Indigenous people in Canada. Or, since, or they only report problems, right? So you're always getting this sense in which Indigenous people in Canada are in crisis or in some kind of political struggle. And of course those political struggles are real and their um, many social issues are also very real. But that is not the whole story about Indigenous people and their cultures in this country. And because I come from, I came to Canada as an immigrant and I, and I guess it's sort of in some ways both ironic but also natural that I would have become a Canadian literature professor. But the more I went on in my own education in terms of Canadian literature, I, I realized pretty quickly that um, I really knew nothing about Indigenous literatures and it was up to me to educate myself because at that time in the 1980s, um, there wasn't a whole lot of scholarship written about that. So um, when I came to do my, my um, PhD dissertation, that's when I really um, got more involved with l studying life writing by Indigenous people. And that, that was important, um, not only in terms of my own education, but also it reshaped the way I thought about my teaching um, and what I wanted to contribute um, to um, Canadian literary studies. I was also last year a visiting professor at the University of Zagreb and so I, um, part, as part of a way of keeping my people back here, um, colleagues, friends, family, kind of informed of what my experience was, was being away for four months and teaching um, at the University of Zagreb in Croatia, I, I started a blog called Lady Professor in the Balkans, the title of which got me into a lot of trouble with Croatians who don't like to think of themselves as Balkans, but as Europeans. But anyway, it was, um, that was when the Lady Professor persona kind of got developed. And then, um, and then I, I, when I became involved in alumni outreach for the, in the Department of English, when I came back from Croatia, um, the Lady Professor became Lady English Professor and I was blogging um, in the department, the, for the English department for 
I guess it was just a little less than a year, so I kind of initiated that. I think it's really important to continue to um, maintain a relationship with English alumni, so when uh, Professor Easton, the chair of the English department, asked me to take on that role as alumni, well, what was I called, alumni something? <laughs> anyway, um, it, was, it was an exciting opportunity to think about ways of um, of engaging and, and sort of keeping in contact with alumni and also uh, maintaining real relationships with them. And I immediately thought of the blog as a way to do that, to, to, to have a kind of a home base, if you like, that people um, could, could just bookmark and check in on regularly or subscribe or follow the blog. And, you know, we've been trying out different ideas about what kinds of stories alumni would be interested in. Um, but then, I was approached to take on um, this position as Associate Dean Graduate Studies in the Faculty of Arts and I well, it took about a week to think about that because it's quite a big, um, it's quite a change from being an English professor in the department but I decided that it it's, it's, um, was the right time in my career to do it. It's another way of helping students, particularly graduate students. It's another way of enhancing the educational experience of students here at the University of Waterloo. Um, and I guess I thought that I had enough kind of organizational skills to take this on, but it did mean that I had to give up being the English department blogger. So I read it with great interest. I would I comment on it, but I guess it also frees up more my time to do my own um, Lady English Professor blog that is about my research.